Thank you. We're starting now. I go. That's what you want. That's you want. Go for your that. You don't catch up to yourself in a minute. Well, Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Cindy Huber, and I am the director of the National Kidney Foundation here in Wisconsin. Uh, we're coming to you live from our office in uh, West Allis, and we have um, a variety of uh, guests with us tonight, and you'll hear from them. Um, so we're very excited to kick off our 2019 Living Donors uh, Together webinar series. And this year, our uh, two organizers, uh, whom you'll meet shortly, Michelle Sherman and uh, Jill Dillon, have organized, I think, a very exciting uh, set of programs for us uh, this year. So um, thank you for uh, your patience as we are kind of playing with technology here. So Living Donors Together was um, a brainchild that kind of, I, I want to give credit to uh, Michelle and Jill um, in terms of um, coming together. Our office uh, was contacted by Living Donors in different parts of the state and I just uh, sensed that um, many times they um, had a need to maybe connect. And so um, I ran that idea by Michelle and Jill and kind of from that brainstorming came our uh, group and the creation. Our goal, as you can see, is um, to um, kind of keep everyone current on a living donation um, because many of you are, and all of you are really advocates of living donation and transplantation. And so it's important, I think, to keep you updated on what's happening. I think it's important to network. Um, and um, there are some instances we've heard from many of you in terms of things that you want to know about as it relates to nutrition or perhaps dealing with your primary care physicians, uh, etc. But our main purpose is to inspire you and to um, we're committed to helping save even more lives and here in our state, et cetera. I think I checked yesterday and uh, there's over 1600 people just waiting for kidneys still here in Wisconsin. Um, and so a great resource and a way to stay connected and Michelle and Jill will talk more about that later is through our private Facebook group. We're just having a little technical detail there. Well, this is at the end of our talk, so. I think, here we go. There we go. Um, no, that's at the very end. Oh. We're at the end of our presentation, so you haven't missed it. Uh, we'll have to somehow get to the front of the PowerPoint slide. So there we go. That's, well, there's, there's me. Look at me. Oh, okay. All right. Not sure how we got to the end, but we got a, a new mouse here, so my apologies. Um, um, so tonight, uh, we will um, uh, introduce you to some of the folks that are going to speak. We have an outstanding um, update uh, in terms of advocacy. We'll have a chance and uh, we have a great clinical expert with us here tonight to um, share um, any questions or comments, etc. And um, we will also talk about, with April being Donate Life Month, some opportunities that are uh, coming up. Excellent. 
Thank you so very much, Cindy. Everyone, this is Michelle Sherman. I am a living kidney donor. And when I am looking at the participant roster, I see that my kidney recipient, Mr. Dick Canusa, and likely his beautiful wife, Rita, are joining us this evening. So you'll see me pictured there on the left with uh, Dick. And we celebrate life. We celebrate uh, the transplant process. And I am so honored and thrilled to be a part of Living Donors Together of Wisconsin. Cindy is absolutely correct. After donating four and a half years ago at Freightert, I said, gosh, wouldn't it be great if there would be a way to connect and with other living donors in our state and share experiences and stories. And the power of an ask, the power of a conversation, um, and just the will and the passion of the donor community that we have in Wisconsin brought this together. So on behalf of Jill Dillon, who is pictured on the right with her lovely uh, living donor, living kidney recipient, we are thrilled to be your co-chairs of this initiative. There is, will be a series of webinars, a series of in-person engagements. Please, as Cindy referenced the Facebook group, please join, participate, post pictures, stories, news. Uh, we would love to um, continue the great momentum and communication and chatter that's happening on that Facebook group. There is where we will post a lot of happenings. We'll repost things from um, our partners in the state, but we'll also share original content. So we look forward to your participation there. I am thrilled this evening to have in the room with us our tonight's clinical expert. So not only do I have the good fortune of having the connection to Freighter Healthcare, I am also a team member with Aurora Healthcare and have worked with Jeff in his role as the Living Kidney Donor Coordinator. And Jeff has been in this role for five years, but is, is not new to, to healthcare or to Aurora. He is a 22-year veteran. And we are thrilled that he will be here this evening with us as a clinical expert to answer any questions you may have as it relates to uh, the living transplant donation. process or right. living donation. And at this time, I will introduce Jeff to tell you more about himself. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I feel honored for you guys asking me to sit on your panel tonight. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Living Kidney Donor Coordinator for Aurora Healthcare at St. Luke's. Um, and I, um, my, my role is to help potential donors go through the donor evaluation and coordinate appointments uh, with a goal of them being approved to be a living kidney donor and setting surgeries. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'll be sitting here to answer them. And um, with that. Wonderful, and as we look at the participant list, we see another friendly name on there, Ms. Joan Heimler. Thank Hi, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Joan, and others. This is a great group joining us for the kickoff presentation here in 2019. Here's more information about Aurora Healthcare and their transplant services. We are ready to kick off the 2019 series, Real People, Real Stories. Again, as this committee or this group was formed, it was to hear stories, to, he to talk to other living donors, to hear from recipients um, what was real, the real stories. And we are thrilled this evening for Sue to be here to share her 30 year kidney recipient journey and to talk about her fabulous living donor. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Sue. Hi, everybody. Um, my brother Jim was very um, adamant on being my um, kidney donor 30 years ago. Um, I found out when I was 19 that I had kidney disease. And at that point, I only had 30% usage left. So my doctors put me on the medications and he was watching my creatinine level. And at a certain point, he had us meet the uh, transplant team at Freighter. 
my coordinator at that point was Susie Gallagher, and we met with Dr. Mark Adams and Dr. Rosa and Dr. Johnson. And then they continued to, they, then they tested my brothers, my two brothers and my sister, and my younger brother Jim and my sister Deb were, at that point, the best matches were, there were, and those were four antigen matches. I believe they're higher now, I'm not 100% sure. And then once my creatinine reached a certain level, they scheduled the surgery. And the day I went in, my creatinine went through the roof. But um, I was very blessed not to have to do dialysis. And I was in two days before the transplant, started the uh, transplant meds that first day I was in. And I woke up with the moon face the next day and kind of just wanted to go home and not do it. So um, I'm blessed with a very... Um, Excuse me. Loving husband who was there for me for the whole thing. And everything has been great since. Well, it's very good that you had a support system in place to help you with the recovery. And yes, the recovery was long, but man, it's worth it. it it's so worth it. I only had um, one incident of rejection, and they put me on the new meds. and. I've been really good since. That was about six years ago. So that's my story. What, what do you know about um, Jim's experience as a living donor? <laughs> and maybe you could explain why Jim isn't joining us oh. because he was going to be here. <laughs> yes, tonight. he was going to be here. He uh, had to have a knee replacement and they had to put it off for two weeks to yesterday. And he's still in the hospital trying to deal with that. Um, his experience is he actually fought with my sister as to who would donate and he won. <laughs> That's what he really wanted to do because we've always been very close. Um, that little stinker beat me out of bed. We had a bet as to who get out of bed first and he got out first and he came in my room and then we would take our morning and afternoon walks along the hallways of freighter and the nurses would laugh at us because both of us were kind of hunched over with the, uh, the pain of the sutures and I had the IVs coming out of my neck and we're just walking around with our IV poles and getting better together and which was very very nice that we could go get through it together and um, since his his uh, surgery he's been doing very well with the one kidney I know it, I know he did have some pain because he had the full removal from what I understand now they do it with robotics and three little puncture wounds and a little three inch, did you say? Oh, yeah. No, he has the full scar with two ribs actually had to be cut to get the kidney out. So so, so 30 years ago, Jeff, what, what is Sue they, describing? That's how they used to remove the kidney, what they called open nephrectomy. It was an incision from the belly button, from the belly button all the way to the back with the removal of ribs. So mm -hmm. the recovery process for donors was much longer than what it is today. Um, the procedure today to, to do a, a nephrectomy or a removal of a kidney is uh, at St. Luke's we use the robotic laparoscopic nephrectomy method, meaning and to remove the kidney that involves um, three puncture holes and a, a three and a half inch incision down by your waistline. So the recovery of this uh, procedure is so much less invasive than it used to be 30 years ago. So therefore the recovery time for donors is much faster. So at St. Luke's, the average length of stay for our donors is uh, overnight to a two day hospital stay. And then recovery time for, our, for donors is anywhere from three to six weeks. So a lot of my donors are back to work three weeks after donation. Granted, you know, they work in an office or a desk job, but my donors have a more physical demanding position. They're going to take up to their six weeks because of the lifting restrictions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the process, you know, currently is, is so much better for the donors. And, um, you know, it's also, you know, it you know, helps donors decide whether or not they really want to go through this. But uh, once they find out that the recovery process is, you know, three weeks to a month, you know, they don't think that's bad compared to what they've read in the past. 
Hello, everyone. This is Michelle. I see we have a question from the field. I thought this would be a good time to ask it. All right. Yeah. So this question comes from Sarah. The question is, were Sue and her brother on the same floor at Freightert? And then at one time, donors and recipients were on different floors. No, Jimmy and I were on the same floor um, at Freighter. He was, I was in the transplant unit and he was down the hall and around the corner, which I don't think was transplant at that time. So he would walk down to my room and I'd walk down to his room and we'd go for our walk. So yes, we were on the same floor. Absolutely. And for me, four and a half years ago, it was the same as well. It was great motivation, wasn't yes, it? To, it was. To get up and walk and start moving to go visit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really, it was nice for my mom as well. She only had to go a little ways to see each of us. So it was real nice for her. Excellent. What else would you like to share about your, your transplant journey? I'm sorry, you were people, but Frederick's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I love them both. And I love well, them all. We, we, all we love everybody at the <laughs> National <laughs> Kidney Foundation. I mean, this is Cindy. We have, we have the opportunity to work with. And we, our, our, we all have the same goals. So. Yes. Our, our <laughs> friends at Aurora, our friends at uh, Freighter, and our friends at UW, as well as our friends at Children's. We're mm -hmm. very, I think, blessed in our state to oh, have... Yeah, actually four of the finest transplant centers in the country. And so uh, each of our programs were, we will feature um, at a, a future Living Donors Together, our clinical expert will join us on, uh, one time from Freighter and one time from UW. But it's, it's okay tonight to uh, have your col colors on. It is March <laughs> Madness, by the way. So, um, and, uh, but uh, what, um, for, for living donors that, um, you know, are interacting with their recipients, uh, what messages, I mean, 30 years is amazing. Can you kind of talk about your life and kind of what you've been able to do because of living donation? <laughs> what, what, you know, because your brother Jim gave you an opportunity to do a lot of things in 30 years. What, what are some of those things? What are those gifts? Because not all living donors um, maybe have a chance to interact closely because they might be a, an anonymous donor, uh, they might be part of a, an exchange, but perhaps never meet a recipient. What would you want to tell living donors about some of the opportunities that life has brought you because of Jim's gift? I got to watch my daughter grow up. So, um, I've had a great life. I've been very blessed with a wonderful family. Like I said, I got to watch my daughter grow up. I had to have her a year early. We had to move our wedding up so I could have her because once the transplant, um, Dr. Adams says, I couldn't have any more kids. Um, now that was 30 years 30 ago. 30 years ago. And kind of the thinking right. then, I assume, right. Jeff. <laughs> yes. So we moved our wedding up and um, we were able to get pregnant right away. And she was... Um, a full month early and I was in the hospital for probably a good month and uh, one of the days the nurse came in and said your nephrologist is fighting with your um, obstetrician. <laughs> the nephrologist wanted the baby out yesterday and the obstetrician says no we have to wait. <laughs> so um, she was a full month early we were able to take her home with us. She was a little five pound bean and now she's tall. <laughs> so I, that's my most um, favorite thing about having the transplant. I'm able to live. I'm able to have 33 years with my husband. And um, we go camping all the time. And before the transplant, I was so anemic. I couldn't really do much of anything. Chuck was taking care of her at last six months before my transplant. So I'm very, very blessed with my life. So I live a full life. Nothing holds me back. So actually, my husband calls me a tank. <laughs> he says, you take whatever medical things that life throw at you and you just, fine, let's do it and move on. You can't not. You can't sit and complain about it. You have, you've been given a gift, so live your life. That's what Jim intended, and that's what I'm doing. So. Hi, Sue. This is Jill. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
Hey, sorry, I had some uh, problems logging in, but I'm in now. Hey, since he's your brother, I'm curious, does he hold it over you as brothers would do? You know, does he say things? <laughs> that would have been my older brother. <laughs> but Jimmy, Jimmy, no, he's wonderful. He's He always says anything for you. So that's awesome. And you know, being a brother or sister, it might be fun for him to do that. I was curious if he took advantage of that over the years. No, no. He and I have always been close. We're only uh, four years apart. My older brother, like I said, he would, but in a loving way. He wouldn't. No, right. Yeah. Nasty, but yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah. Teasing way. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. What would Jim say if he was here about his life and how it's, how it's changed for in any way? Due to you know, I don't think his living. life really changed. He's just living the way that he was intended to live it and he goes to the doctor regularly to make sure the kidney's working fine. And every time I go in for my anniversary um, appointment, they ask how he's doing. And um, we're just living a very happy, blessed life. So I know I don't, I, I don't believe he has any regrets. I, <laughs> I, I really don't think so. Um, but he's just been amazing always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yet that was not common 30 years ago, kidney transplants. No. So, so you know, so freighters mentioned that, or they, your doctor referred you to the freighters? Yes. When um, I first went to my nephrologist, he did not even know about my disease, and he had to talk to another doctor about it, and they were doing a lot of trials with the medications to get my levels to where they're supposed to be. So I was very happy that I didn't have to do dialysis. So yeah, so the first transplants in Wisconsin started in 1966, and I believe the UW National Kidney Foundation of Wisconsin was formed in uh, 1968. And you have to realize that was the pre-internet. There weren't apps. There weren't the cell phones. And so really, our organization. Um, was kind of the genesis of um, physicians, dedicated people. So at Freighter, uh, Dr. Kaufman started the program there at Madison, um, you know, the home of the famous UW solution that preserves organs, you know, um, those physicians there. Um, they came together and it was really family members too that were trying to save lives and they kind of brought people together but they had to bring them physically together to share because like Sue was saying many people didn't have experiences and so they they reach out to either people that they maybe went to medical school with or they knew you know they knew Madison had a program or whatever and they shared information and so I feel fortunate that it was really our organization that kind of brought people together having conferences because again information was not a text away it really was faxed and, and calling but Wisconsin really led the way in transplant but you're right it was so it might be unusual. I mean, many times transplant even wasn't discussed as an option because um, dialysis was actually an, an enterprise that physicians engaged in. So there were a, a lot of things um, going on. So, um, you know, you were blessed to be at a great um, institution mm -hmm. and great doctors, just like we have today, um, who are coming together. What would you tell the, the recipients of today in terms of living their life, what 30 years post-transplant would look like? Um, well, you have the transplant to live, so enjoy your life. Um, follow your doctor's orders, take your meds, <laughs> and uh, just live because life is so short. You just have to take every day. Every birthday, you know, so many people say, oh, my God, I'm a year older. For me, it's I had another year and I wake up very happy that I've been here another year, which in all honesty, I really shouldn't have been. So we're good. We're taking life and living it the way God intended to live it. So 
Mm -hmm. We would like to open up the floor. If anyone has any questions, please type those into the group chat bar. Any questions that you might have for Sue or for Jeff or for Cindy? No. Before we started, you were talking, you and your brother celebrate your anniversary. Right. And you just had a big party. Yes, we did. <laughs> we had a 30th. You can see by the picture we're wearing our shirts. And um, we had over 40 people come. Cindy actually came and, and joined us. And we had a fantastic time. Family, friends, everybody that has helped me through the, my transplant journey from day one, or actually the day I found out I had the kidney disease, all the way through present day. I had some that have been with me, friends that have been with me from the very beginning. And even the friends towards this last five years were, you know, you still you still get sick. I mean, I'm, I'm still getting over a two week, on the second week of a cold. And, uh, you know, that's just all part of it. That's the one drawback of transplant is being immunosuppressed. Even 30 years out, I'm still taking my immunosuppression drugs. And you just have to be careful, wash your hands stay around healthy people. But um, we had we had a great time. We had a fantastic time. I'm so glad I did that. Honoring Jim, which is basically what it was. It wasn't about me, it was about Jim. So. Mm -hmm. now, do you know if you're the longest living kidney donor and recipient? I, I don't think so because there was a gentleman um, that was 47 years. We went to the um, something at Freighter for the 50th anniversary, and he was 47 years. And I remember telling myself, I only have so many more years to go. So um, that's going to be, I'm going to get there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And actually, there is a uh, recipient near the Wausau area that I believe um, her sister was the donor, and I believe she is actually 52 years oh. out. Wow. Another another goal to get to. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a couple of questions coming in. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, the question is, what kind of restrictions, if any, did Jim have after donation since it was an open surgery? And how long were those restrictions in place? I actually went to work before him. He had to be off a little longer. Um, but I, I think it was just the regular surgery restrictions, no lifting, no driving for so long that type of thing. I I mean, probably the same he has now with his new replacements. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think anything overly special because he was a donor. Mm -hmm. well, we are thankful for modern technology and advancements that it's a more minimally invasive procedure <laughs> today. <laughs> and a question from Joan Heimler. Who paid for the cost of your brother's evaluation and donation 30 years ago? This is where it was really nice. What my insurance didn't cover for myself, Freighter 8. What my insurance and Jim's insurance did not cover for him, Freighter 8. So neither one of us had to pay a dime. So I don't think they do that now. But it was very, very nice. I was very shocked and surprised. I was surprised my insurance would even have covered his, but it did because he was donating it to me. We'll allow Jeff, if you will. He's like, oh, <laughs> to talk about modern day practice. <laughs> um, right now, the recipients, or excuse me, the donors, their evaluation process, uh, testing, hospital stay, surgery, it's all billed under the recipient's insurance. Um, you know, when a recipient comes in to go through their kidney donor or kidney evaluation to be active on the wait list, you know, the financial counselor verifies their insurance and um, also checks to see if they're eligible for a living kidney donor. Um, so once they're eligible and they're through their evaluation and they're approved, and on the wait list, then their donors can start calling me um, to go through the process. Uh, so that's kind of changed. 
Um, like we mentioned earlier, you know, the procedure itself with modern technology, you know, we uh, removed the kidney by robotic uh, laparoscopic nephrectomy versus the open nephrectomy, meaning the you know, recovery time is much faster for donors. Uh, they're back to work anywhere from three to six weeks after surgery. Um, so therefore they're not losing a lot of wages. Um, and um, you know, their physical activity, they're, you know, they're not laid up in bed for that long of a period compared to years ago. And as Jeff and Sue and I were talking before the webinar launched, the with the joys of social media and that opportunity for recipients and just the transplant community in general to share uh, messages and uh, needs for, for organ donation, I believe that is true for the financial opportunities as well. I see so many GoFundMe pages and websites created to help support the financial costs for uh, either the recipient or the donor. So uh, some of those things get posted on our Living Donors Together of Wisconsin Facebook group as well. One question from Jen Davis. What specific anti-rejection meds or drugs, I'm sorry, are you currently taking? Um, prednisone, Silcept, and um, Prograf? Yes, Prograf, thank you. I was getting Prograf and GenGraf. It was Imuran and Cyclosporin, but when I had the uh, rejection episode, they changed me all over to the new. So. Excellent. Well, we thank you so very much for You're being welcome. here with us this evening. Thank you. Such an honor to celebrate a 30-year success story as we kick off the Real real Stories, Real People, Real People, Real Stories series this year. And if Sydney gets an invite to all of the parties, we want to be at the next one and the next one and the yeah, next I, one. I have to say, it was great food. <laughs> it was. Uh, I, in, in fact, I love going anywhere. There, yeah, I'm open uh, as long as there's uh, great food. And there really was great food and great company. And uh, even though I didn't uh, know only a few people, I, I actually knew everybody, everyone. It, it really is a the living donor and transplant community, as all of you know and have experienced, is certainly one where you're automatically a family, and that's why we did Living Donors together. We're, we are all family in this, so that's Sue, okay. thank you. You're welcome. I know I, you. I know I did twist your arm <laughs> over uh, some of the anniversary cake <laughs> tonight, so thank you so much. <laughs> you got a piece, right? I did. <laughs> Well, part of the webinar series and the goal of, again, Living Donors Together is to, to educate and to connect and also to advocate and to keep those of us that are part of this group connected to what's happening in our state, what's happening in our nation and across the globe. And we are thrilled to welcome Sarah Hicklin to, and I'll, I'll let Cindy give a full introduction of Sarah and her role, but we're thrilled to have Sarah join us this evening and in other webinars this year to share about an advocacy, to share the advocacy updates. Because again, this, this reach, meets that goal of giving us as living donors an opportunity to act and to connect and to share our voice uh, in the transplant community. So Sarah, I will let Cindy give a brief introduction and thank you for joining us this evening. So uh, Sarah joins us from uh, near the lacrosse area tonight and I think if we want to advance this I'll just give you a little background. Uh, Sarah is, um, there she is, I'm going to talk about you first Sarah and then you'll have to unmute yourself and I'll let you talk but first I want to give a big shout out. Sarah is serving on um, our um, National Kidney Foundation of Wisconsin Advocacy Committee, and she uh, has volunteered to also be a liaison to the Living Donors uh, Together group. 
Um, her story tonight, I think you'll find as a great uh, compliment to Sue's story, and I don't want to steal any of Sarah's thunder, but uh, she um, is an amazing new volunteer for our organization, and Sarah, we're so proud to welcome you tonight. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. Um, I am very pleased to join this group and be the uh, liaison and tell you about what's going on with advocacy. And just to give you a very brief description of how I became involved, uh, my family has polycystic kidney disease, and I am the third of my siblings to receive a transplant. Like Sue, um, very fortunate that all of us were able to get transplant before we needed dialysis. And I am just six months out from my transplant and um, doing very well. But it was a real challenge to find a living donor. And because when you have a family disease, uh, you know, a lot of the <laughs> potential donors are used up with the older siblings. And um, I had quite a few donors or people who were interested in being donors who either couldn't because of health reasons or because they couldn't um, afford to take time off work. And um, there were other barriers in their way. And I've decided that the best way for me to give back to the living donor community is to become an advocate and try to make that path easier. So very briefly, my kidney came to me from a complete stranger um, who happened to hear about living kidney donation at a Super Bowl party. And she thought, I can do that, signed up, and then has a friend who works in the donation community who works also with my sister. And through this whole chain of events, her kidney, uh, she donated on my behalf, and that's what led me to getting a kidney. So that's a very brief story about me, and I would like to start talking about some advocacy activities that we've been involved in. So we'll, there you go, Sarah. Great. So um, just recently, we had the sixth annual 2019 Kidney Patients Summit in Washington, D.C., and this is uh, an activity that's organized by the National Kidney Foundation. Um, this month, it was March, I mean, this year, it was March 4th and 5th. It involves advocates from all around the country. Um, they meet with lawmakers, and they have a number of um, talking points that they discuss with the lawmakers to try to improve the lives of kidneys. And pictured here are the two representatives from Wisconsin. Um, and I'm not sure who the guy with the orange scarf is. But these are two co-members of the Kidney Advocacy Committee that is organized by the National Kidney Foundation. And if you want to move to the next slide. Uh, well, my smart technical assistant. Um, yeah, I'm rolling. Now I have to do some technical difficulties here. Yep. Oh, I was too, I was pressing too hard. My apologies. <laughs> I am, like, so uh, I, I was, I was born way before the National Kidney Foundation was ever founded. <laughs> My apologies. That, that's fine. Um, these are the main talking points um, that the advocates were talking about. And the first is the Living Donor Protection Act. Um, on the Senate side of the House, it's Senate Bill 511. And on the House side, it's Bill 1224. Uh, the House bill, I believe both bills were just introduced um, for this Congress on February 14th. So it was very new legislation when um, all of our advocates were on the Hill. And we'll uh, share a little bit about what that bill involves. Um, basically, it's to provide living donors protection against um, discrimination by life insurance companies, because sometimes living donors are, if they have to change life insurance policies or get new policies, they can be charged higher rates because they have been a living donor. Um, it also tries to uh, include living donors under the Family Medical Leave Act because right now they are not necessarily included um, and it would provide them with job safety and security um, for after their recovery period and there's some other um, aspects of the bill as well, but those are the main points of it. Then, um, 
were looking for a champion or a series of champions to introduce legislation that would extend Medicare coverage for immunosuppressive medication. Um, recipients have to be on immunosuppressive medication for the rest of their lives, but currently Medicare only covers uh, recipients for three years post-transplant if they are under age 65 and haven't aged into Medicare coverage. So if you're a very young person, say you're a child or you're in your 20s and you only have Medicare coverage for those drugs for the first three years, there's a real distinct chance that um, if you lose health insurance or don't have other means to cover those, what can be very expensive medications, and you have to stop taking them, then you're probably going to reject that kidney, which is just much more expensive for the Medicare program, and you'd have to go on dialysis anyway, and it would just make sense to cover those anti-rejection medications for the rest of the recipient's life. So we're looking for champions to take that on and introduce that legislation and try to get it passed, a process that will probably take a number of years, but um, it's well worth the fight. They also discussed some appropriations funding requests there were um, five different requests that we're asking, and since this is budget time on the Hill, um, it's a really good time to ask for either increased funding for certain um, activities. So one of them is to promote cost-effective early testing and treatment for chronic kidney disease to slow the progression of kidney disease and prevent or postpone kidney failure. Another is to um, include the National Living Donor Assistance Center and upcoming demonstration to cover living donor lost wages. That's all handled by the Division of Transplantation. Um, there's another initiative to increase funding for community health centers and to implement changes to increase early detection and treatment for chronic kidney disease. Um, the fourth one is to Increase funding to expand research on progression and treatments for kidney, chronic kidney disease. Despite the large federal investment in caring for people with kidney failure, funding for kidney disease research is only approximately $600 million annually, um, which may sound like a large fund amount of money, but when you compare that to some of the research that's being done into other conditions, it's a drop in the bucket. And the final um, funding allocation request regards Kidney X, which is the Kidney Innovation Accelerator, a public-private partnership between the Department of Health and Human Services and the American Society of Nephrology to accelerate innovation in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of kidney disease. And as I'll mention in a few minutes, the Secretary of Health and Human Services addressed the group and um, talked about their priorities as well. So here are the, the two representatives that we had, Adam Jardine and Mary Balaker. Um, they, again, are with me on the Kidney Advocacy, Advocacy Committee, um, and they were invited to go to Washington this year, so they, they did Sorry. a great job. Sorry. They met with... A sensitive mouse. I apologize. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, they met with five of our congressmen, so they met with both senators' staff and with... Um, so Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson, and they also met with Mark Pocan, Gwen Moore, and Representative Ron Kine's offices, and both Gwen Moore and Ron Kine signed on to co-sponsor the Living Donor Protection Act. So um, they just did fantastic work uh, while they were there, and that's a lot of meeting. It doesn't, I mean, it, 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 that's a lot of meeting <laughs> on Capitol Hill, so they did a great job. Um, and really need to be commended for getting both Gwen Moore and Ron Kine to co-sponsor um, H.R. 1224. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's backwards. Yeah. Oh, we're having trouble with the little arrows. Oh, look. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so on the left is um, Health and Human Services Secretary uh, Azar, and on the right is the a CEO of the National Kidney Foundation, and whose name escapes me right now. And that's Kevin Longino, and he himself there you go. is a kidney recipient. Yep. Um, so it was really, it, it, it's a big deal to get the Secretary of Health and Human Services to speak to a group on Capitol Hill, and he really emphasized uh, what the Health and Human Services, and, and that's, by the way, the division that's in charge uh, eventually of Medicare and Medicaid, um, their priorities, uh, he really discussed their priorities related to kidneys and a lot of what the National Kidney Foundation wanted to focus on match up very closely to what he's focusing on. 
for the next couple of years. So um, it sounds like that was an amazing speech. And you can actually get uh, a transcript of the entire speech off the kidney.org, the National Kidney Foundation website. So one of the changes that they're talking about is what is a high-risk kidney? Right now, um, as a recipient, you're asked if you want to receive a high-risk kidney, and they tell you what those definitions are. And uh, Health and Human Services wants to actually change that definition so that it would actually make more kidneys available to recipients. Um, there's been huge advances, and uh, our expert might be able to address this a little bit more, but at, at one time you couldn't accept a kidney from a patient who had um, certain diseases, and a lot of that has changed over the years, and HHS is trying to kind of catch up with the research and just, you know, again, try to make more kidneys available to more recipients. Um, the National Living Donor Assist can we go back a sec? Yes, I'm sorry. The National Living Donor Assistance Program um, is something that I didn't even know existed until I started researching this particular update. Um, and there is, in some instances, assistance available to living donors in terms of housing and transportation, um, and in some cases, lost wages when they're uh, being a donor. Um, and there's a new pilot this summer for the Division of Transplantation to do a, a very similar project. And I think it's extremely exciting that some focus is being done on the living donors and making it easier for them. And then again, Secretary Azar talked about Kidney X, that, that public-private partnership um, to just accelerate innovation for prevention and diagnosis um, and treatment of kidney diseases. So overall, the results were really pretty impressive. There were 180 meetings with congressional offices, 37 with the legislators themselves, and 143 with staff. And what that means is that when you go to Washington, D.C., um, it's pretty rare to meet with your actual representative, be it a congressman or a, uh, I mean, a senator or a representative, because they're so busy, they're on the floor, they're voting, they're, you know, they've got 85 things that they're trying to consider for that day. Um, and it can be very difficult to get an appointment with them. However, they have a very um, well-educated staff and they have staff dedicated to health issues, and that's usually who you would meet with um, during a meeting like this and tell them your story and um, ask them to get the, the representative to sponsor the legislation that you're um, supporting. And so to have 37 meetings with the actual legislators is very impressive, but 180 meetings overall is great. Um, at the time of the conference, there were 12 House members and one senator that signed on to be co-sponsors of the act, and that's actually increased now to 15 House members. Last I checked, um, and I didn't see if any additional senators had co-sponsored, because sometimes you can ask for that, and they're not going to do it that day. They might do it the following week, two weeks, even a month down the road. Um, one of the other things that affected us locally is Representative Ron Kind, who represents my area up here in La Crosse, is, uh, was honored at the Congressional Awards Reception as a leading advocate for kidney health and kidney patients. Um, so you can believe I'm going to be having a lot of meetings with him and congratulating him and asking for his support on some of our other activities. So what can you do to help? Um, we always encourage contacting your representatives and setters about co-sponsoring this Living Donor Protection Act. And when you give them the specific bill numbers, that makes it much easier. You can write them letters or send them emails. You can connect on social media. Um, Twitter is a very popular way of connecting with um, a lot of our representatives. And you can call their offices, either their local offices or their lock, um, office in Washington, D.C. And if you look them up in the phone book, both of those numbers would be listed. And then a, right now is a great time to meet with legislators because they're at home um, during March and a lot of them are having listening sessions. Um, if you work, unfortunately, they're often during the day. But it's a great opportunity to meet with them and ask for their support and co-sponsoring these bills. Oh. And then I also wanted, oh, is that, was that me? No. Nope. The next no. one? Oh, yeah, I think that's still you. you are. <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, there you go. So uh, a couple of other things that we wanted to talk about, and I, I've, these might have been switched around a little bit because I know I had mentioned um, 
not only the pause to give life, but also the survey that went out? And Cindy, maybe you want to address that instead of me. Um, well, actually, um, I made a little switcheroo today because uh, Crystal, our intern that's been working on them, is going to can give a little update. So my apologies. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, so she's live and here in person. And um, so I put her on the spot late this afternoon, and I'm sorry I didn't get to tell you. So do you mind just updating us on what Pause to Give Life is? Sure. Pause to Give Life is an activity that's held at uh, transplant centers and other organizations that are active with the donor and recipient communities. And this activity takes place on April 1st. It's scheduled at 108 local hospitals and transplant centers. There's a flag raising at 10.08 in the morning. So there's a special Donate Life flag that gets raised. And that time is significant because it indicates that one person can save eight lives. And that's followed by a moment of silence for a minute and 14 seconds, representing the 114,000 people nationally on the waiting list. And that's all organs. Um, and you can always go to Donate Life Wisconsin's event Facebook page to find an event near you. For um, living donors, they do encourage you, if you have a picture of your recipient, to um, take that picture with you so that you can show, you know, this is, I was a donor and this was my recipient. Um, and of course, dress for the weather because these are going to be outside. Um, and there's often news media present, so it's a great opportunity to be able to um, just make pe more people aware of the need for kidney donation, be it deceased kidneys or living um, kidney donors. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to just interrupt you, Sarah. Um, Jeff, are you having a ceremony um, at your transplant center? We do annually, and um, it's in the front of the hospital um, with the American flag. Next to that is the donate flag. So every year we do have a ceremony uh, outside. We raise the new flag. Um, a donor family is usually honored. Um, we uh, move the uh, not the party, but we move to the healing garden and pastoral care and, and uh, other doctors are there to um, deliver speeches and and their thanks to the donor family. That, but that's it's an open honored. event, yes, so it's people open. in the community, um, so again, visiting the Donate Life Wisconsin, I think, events and Facebook page is a great way um, to see what all the Donate Life organizations throughout the state are doing. So the Wisconsin Lions Eye Bank, the various tissue banks in our state, uh, et cetera. So um, donors are honored um, as well as highlighting, as Sarah said, the, the need um, for folks still waiting. All right, um, Sarah, is it okay if I steal a little bit of your thunder and put Crystal on the spot because she actually is working on a, um, she's our like boots on the ground, uh, taking our needs and uh, uh, talking. And so she's really, uh, I'll have her introduce herself and um, um, indicate how she's kind of really embraced this very important project. So Crystal, welcome tonight. Who are who are you? Hi, hi I'm Crystal. Um, I'm a current um, student at Carroll University. I'm majoring in public health and I'm interning with the National Community Foundation this semester. Um, so when I first came in, me and Cindy were talking about what we wanted to do for the semester and I had noted that I had an interest in policy and how important policy can be and um, we decided to do a project around creating a toolkit for um, people that aren't covered by FMLA, um, no that are in smaller um, companies with 50 people or less. So we started by creating a survey which um, is in the lower corner of the screen um, and just a few questions about um, were you employed, um, how many people were in your company, what kind of industry you were and then we asked a few questions about um, if you were paid and if there were written policy. And today I actually had some time to um, look at the 57 surveys that we did get back and kind of process the data. And a few things that I noted was that 79% um, of people that were employed received paid time off, um, which is a pretty good amount. But of that 
70% um, the, the 40% people use their personal PTO, including vacation and sick time. So I guess it's not really paid time off because they have to give their own time to do that. Um, and then we, I had two respondents actually um, that were able to put policy change in place um, around kidney donation in their places of employment. Um, one of them was in, implementing pooled vacation sick days at a school. Um, so all the teachers donated their paid sick days so that she was not um, left unpaid during her recovery. And she was a living donor. Yes, yeah, she was a living donor. So this policy involves, um, uh, or we're exploring, I think, how to eliminate barriers for people that want to be living donors. And um, a barrier in our state that we've identified and the transplant centers have are that people are coming forward and they're healthy enough to be living donors, but because they work, as Crystal said, for smaller companies or medium-sized companies that aren't covered under FMLA, um, many times they have to say no to that potential recipient because they're just not able to get paid time off. And because of their family and uh, circumstance, um, that is then a barrier. And then again, a kidney patient winds up with no donor, if that makes sense. So um, it's, it's interesting how some people are coming together to support living donation. Yeah, and um, we were actually able to interview um, another living donor who is also actively working to change policy um, in Green Bay for the county. And he, um, I think he's, they're having a little bit of a break right now, but he's still working at it. And um, of the other questions we asked was what other additional support um, was helpful to people. And, out of the people that responded, um, over 75% of people noted um, like being able to get help driving, um, having meals, support of church and family. I just wanted to know how important that is to the living donors and recipients. Um, and then we still are we still are accepting the survey responses, so we'd love to hear your input. Um, and then we'll get more data out as we get uh, more surveys back. So what what do you hope to accomplish for us and for on behalf of living donors and then jeff i'm going to ask you a question if you're if when you're interviewing potential living donors if you're hearing some of the barriers um you know like i'd love to donate but in terms of their work situation but crystal what what's the object of the game what are you trying to accomplish um so our end goal eventually is to create a policy toolkit. So if someone was to call us, um, and we'd love to implement it and distribute it to um, small employers, but if someone was to call, we would have kind of like, um, just like a list of all different things that someone could do to potentially get paid time off so that they would be able to- Or what an employer could yes, do. Yes, an employer, yes. Um, and we've been talking to a couple of HR ex experts um, who have given us really good advice. Um, and we're working towards creating that little tool list that will then be disseminated to employers in the area. We're, we're hoping then to um, make that available so uh, individuals, let's say like Jeff or the social workers at transplant centers, that it would be a supportive document because uh, we have a lot of people that call here and say, what can I do? I want to give my friend a kidney. But Jeff, do you encounter um, some folks that are healthy, but maybe are having difficulties because of that time off from work? I think that was uh, one of the biggest obstacles for the for donors is the loss of loss of uh, wages, and um, not either their employer doesn't cover that through short term disability or FMLA. And I think that also reflects the decrease in recent years um, from living kidney donors following through because they just can't afford to not get a paycheck for four to six weeks. They have families, a lot of people are, are living paycheck to paycheck. And um, you know, I think that's a, a big dilemma. So hopefully this is not only going to provide some sample policies, so if an employer wants to actually write or insert a policy, 
but it, Crystal's also collecting, and I think we'd love to hear from you, and you can use the private Facebook page. Um, we'd love to hear from you of other ways that you've been supported, maybe by coworkers or even the community, because we want to offer potential living donors I ideas also, because they might work in a business where there's only literally three people, and you know that, you know that that's a different challenge for that employer, and maybe there's other creative ways to support that person. So back. Back to you, Michelle. And, and, and like Mark. Michelle said earlier, you know, a lot, the social media, we've been seeing a lot more GoFundMe uh, for Absolutely. both the donor and the recipients. So people are looking at traveling that avenue. Absolutely, getting savvy on the computers, which we, we always strive to be better. And we thank everyone tonight for being part of this kickoff webinar. We're going to turn the mic. Um, Unmuted. We're going to turn it open to anybody. Yes. Is there any fine? It is seven o'clock. Is there any final questions that anybody has that you would like to ask now? Please type that in. To or, the, or you can unmute yourselves from the program. Any final questions before we go into final announcements? All right. We can take those questions offline. I'll get answers to you or post those questions on the Living Donor Together of Wisconsin Facebook group page. And with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to my co-chair and friend, uh, Ms. Jill Dillon. Hello. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't get on in the beginning. Apparently I had a browser issue. So. Uh, as we probably all know, April is uh, National Donate Life Month, and that's coming up obviously very quickly here. So we just encourage you to reach out to your transplant center or your local transplant center, even if it's not where you donated or where you were a recipient, and you know, ask them for possibilities of ways to get involved, ways to um, volunteer your time. Donate Life Wisconsin is another way to get involved and certainly reach out to them and, um, you know, any of them and see if there's a way that you can get involved, you know, during the month of April and let us know about it. If you're doing something that, you know, you're, you're volunteering, certainly let us know about it. Let us know on our Facebook page, on the Living Donors Together Facebook page um, or the National Kidney Foundation of Wisconsin. Let them know, you know, so that we know that you're getting out there and, and um, hopefully getting the word out about the importance of donation. Michelle, did you have and, anything else? And Jill, Cindy is over here saying, and don't forget about National Kidney Foundation. If you've got questions or interest in connecting, please reach out to National Kidney Foundation. Um, they are a great resource for all of us. Yep, absolutely. And we thank you guys for coming tonight. We hope that you'll join us for our next um, okay. webinar, which is in June. And what's the date on that, Michelle? Do you have that? Is that the 20th? Yeah. I, I probably We're looking at Wednesday, yeah, June 19th. Oh, June 19th. Okay. I thought, we might, I thought we might have some dates there for you guys. Oh, there they are. Absolutely. So we'll have uh, more information coming out when that gets a little bit closer to June 19th, but we certainly hope that you'll join us then. And a shout out for the, this webinar series. Again, real people, real stories. If you yourself or you know someone who would like to share their story, please reach out to myself, to Jill, or to Cindy here at the National Kidney Foundation and share that interest. Uh, we definitely have folks in mind, but if there's somebody that wants to tell their story, we'd love to hear it. And again, we're gonna shamelessly keep plugging the Facebook group. Please join. I know everybody on the line right now, it looks like all of you are members of the Donate uh, Living Donors Together Facebook group. Please share that with with your friends, and I'm Jeff was reminding me that I owe him some business cards to be able to continue to promote that. So our transplant centers are very involved, and we thank them for continuing to share this resource and this social community. Again, as Jill and I and others, uh, when we left the hospital, we were like, now what? How do we stay involved? And this is really a great place uh, to do that. So again, thank you, everybody. And Sarah, I'm going to Let's advocate, let's connect, let's empower, and thank you so much for sharing your updates this evening. 
And one more shout out to Sue and to Jim. Thank you for celebrating life and sharing your story with us. Friendly reminder, tonight's presentation is recorded. You can get a copy of that from the uh, National Kidney Foundation website. Now, I'll just uh, do a little shout out. There's a lot going on in April, uh, but just to remind, to remind you that there, uh, we're hoping that living donors will uh, come out. Um, we have two events coming up this summer that our organization organizes. Um, we, you can volunteer, you can run and walk. Milwaukee, those of you that are in the area, We'd love to have you, uh, before you go out and celebrate for the Kentucky Derby, uh, join us um, at our run and walk. Uh, we have some special events, but we are giving um, a special discount to all living donors that uh, uh, register to either walk or run at the event. But again, just come out. I think it's a great opportunity to meet uh, other living donors and uh, to connect. This is Michelle. I'll be joining the walk this year on May 4th and I'll go in and create a team for living donors oh, together. So if anybody wants to join that team or obviously I know many transplant centers and other groups have teams, but definitely there's groups that you can connect. But definitely join ours as well. All right, we're having... Yeah, I'm sorry to keep going back. Going back to the beginning. Well, that's in case you guys didn't see any of the slides. We'll go really, really fast. Um, but anyway, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thanks to Jill and Michelle for creating and conceptualizing uh, tonight's program again. Jeff, thank you for joining us. I think it's a real asset to have a clinical um, expert in the room with us. So well, thanks thank for inviting me. In. It was fun. <laughs> Yay! We we want to be fun. And Crystal, great great job. Important work because again, sixteen hundred people in our state are depending on us, our work. So thank you all very much for joining us. Oh. And Michelle reminded me that we couldn't do these programs at all without the two volunteers, John and Merle. Both are recipients who are giving back their time um, and make. Um, I don't know Hi, if they're. John. I don't know if they're laughing there or not. They're in two different rooms here at the <laughs> National. Oh, hi, John! Look, he showed himself. He's down the hall. Uh, monitoring our recording of this, but both John and Merle uh, volunteer um, on all of our webinar related programs uh, to make sure that we create access to patients and families and professionals throughout the state. We couldn't do uh, the programs that we do without the help of volunteers throughout the year. So thank you all uh, very much for giving back and sharing um, your gift of life and commitment to providing the gift of life. Thanks to Sarah up there in La Crosse for joining us tonight. Um, and it was a real honor to have you um, uh, keep us posted on ways that we can advocate, not just for patients here in Wisconsin, but patients throughout the country through our advocacy. So Sarah, big shout out to you tonight too. Thank you. My everybody. pleasure, Cindy. Thank you. We'll see you in June.